Hi, my name is Adam from the podcast Filthy Casuals, and this is the most important award show in the world. It's the most wonderful game of the year. We've listed out 20, which we think is plenty. They're all the top tier. They're the most wonderful games of the year. According to us, these are just our opinions after all. So if you disagree with me, then don't comment meanly. Please be an adult. But I'll meet you in the middle and just talk. Number 20. Card Shark is a game about learning how to grift, con, and sleight of hand your way through a series of sometimes surprisingly tense mini-games. Its quirky, captivating art style matches its unique and engaging setting, and masks an occasionally demanding game of risk and memory, and its clever controls ask for a little bit of skill and nuance on top of some puzzle-solving ability. Think WarriorWare, but if Warrior was an olden days French con man instead of a modern day Italian sex symbol. But if you're looking for a little more action, then do I have the 19th best game of the year for you? Roller Drome is a fast-paced, single-player arcade skater shooter. It's Tony Hawk mixed with Unreal Tournament, peppered with Super Hot, and it's impressively smooth and simple to control. It gives it a really appealing pick-up-and-play quality to hook you in, and a pulsing, addictive momentum to keep you in there. The visuals are very cool, and the soundtrack is spectacular. It's honestly one of the best excuses to get into weirdly competitive roller skating this side of a messy bisexual breakup. In 18th place is the Pokemon Game of the Year, Pokemon Legends Arceus. If you've been sleeping on this one because it was pitched as a sort of a side project, it's time for you to wake up and smell the coughing, because this is the best that Pokemon has been in years. Catching, battling, and exploring have all been re-examined and revitalized. The world is enticing and alive, the variety of things to do is engaging and moorish, and there's a ton of character in this really fascinating setting. A lot of what fell flat in Scarlet and Violet is explored here with more confidence and creativity, and it's like Pikachu always says, Pikachu. In 17th place for us is Horizon Forbidden West. It improves on just about every facet of the first game to create a rock solid open world adventure. The graphics are some of the best going around, the combat lets you be creative and precise, and the exploration has been built upon with things like much better climbing and more interesting bits and pieces of side content to find around the world. The story continues the first game's well-written, if maybe a little dry, sci-fi narrative, and the mix of the old world and the new works even better this time around, with Aloy especially showing a bit more understanding of the world that she inhabits. And the acting is good enough to pretty much across the board have it all land. Uh, Speaking, by the way, of boards and landing... 16th place goes to Oli Oli World, the second game on this list from Rollerdrome developers Roll7. It's a simple, snappy and addictive skateboarding side-scroller with fantastic music, an appealing visual style and an excellent level of challenge built into its cool, semi-platformer take on skating. It's got a fun variety of challenges and creative, natural feeling controls. Skateboard? More like skate having fun, I told her before she left me. At number 15, God of War Ragnarok is big budget blockbuster entertainment through and through. It's one of the most impressively large scale games of the year. It'll be higher on some other lists, but the story and writing in the game did not hit anywhere near as hard as God of War 2018 for us, and the game has some issues with its pacing, but the core of the game here is some of the nicest feeling, chunkiest combat you can get your hands on. The environments look beautiful and are a joy to explore, with a really surprising amount of things to do if you're looking to peek into every one of the many high quality nooks and crannies that have been jammed into this game. The story has its moments when it's running at full steam and it can't be stressed enough how appealing it can be to dive into something this detailed and enormous. I think you'll be playing until your thumbs are Thor. Ha ha ha! Ha ha ha! Hoo hoo! Yeah, buddy! Far Changing Tides is in 14th place, and it's a beautiful and meditative journey through a wordless, post-apocalyptic world. You pilot your big metal tube ship through captivating environments and a limbo-y, inside style vibe scroller. 
It's a relatively short journey that you can sink into through an afternoon, and it's completely absorbing while you do. It's the perfect sort of thing to give a go on Game Pass if you've got it, and it's this type of game that has its idea, gets it in front of you, and then gets out of the way, that can stick in your mind for a really long time. Number 13, Bayonetta 3 is the campy burlesque show game that barely squeezes into the technological corset that is the Switch in 2022, but despite that it runs great and controls just as fantastically as the previous games in the series. Though the new summoning systems and the second playable character Viola maybe don't fully measure up to the core Bayonetta gameplay, the over-the-top fun and fluidity is still there and it's exhilarating. It's a ridiculous game and it's ridiculously fun. Elekhead is our number 12 game and is one of the best Game Boy games that never existed. You travel through a series of clever puzzles as a cute little robot with an electrified, detachable head. The puzzles are inventive and often surprising, but always logical, and the presentation is great, and its bite-sized length delivers an extensive variety of twists on its concept without becoming repetitive or tiresome. It's one of those great puzzle games where the moment you think you've got it all figured out is exactly when it knows to throw another electrified head in the works. Plus, Elekhead is cute but not as cute as Mr. Cute himself, Kirby, who's in 11th place with Kirby and the Forgotten Land, a bright, colorful, warm smile of a game with heart and personality bursting from its seams. It's pretty simple and easy, but its charm and enthusiasm makes it a delight to suck down and take into your body, which is Kirby's primary ability. There's a ton to do here with nicely designed levels and a wide variety of power-ups to suck up and swallow down, which is Kirby's main skill. There are fun, extra challenges in each level to gobble up like a little pig, which is what Kirby does. You can go mouthful mode on sub-objects in the environment, which lets you turn effectively into a car or a light bulb or a thing of lockers. All you've got to do is suck on them until they enter you, which is what Kirby's known for. By the way, I don't know if I mentioned, I am Kirby. Number 10, Vampire Survivors. Seems simple at first. Your only controls are to move around with the direction keys and to choose weapons and upgrades as you gain experience gems from the deluge of monsters who swarm towards you. But the more you play, the more its compelling roguelike fangs will sink into you as you uncover the huge number of unlockables that are satisfying both to earn and to use. It's cheap as chips and it's one of the most playable and addictive games of the year. I think much like a vampire, you'll be up all night. <laughs> you like that dog? Ghostwire Tokyo is number nine. It's an atmospheric journey through, of all places, Tokyo, which has become haunted by, of all things, ghosts. You set about solving their problems, mostly by partaking in the game's really satisfyingly hefty feeling first person combat. Don't be put off by its potentially dreary seeming tone either. There's a surprising amount of levity and personality in the game too, with decent writing in its many side quests and really enjoyable main story. And this realization of a haunted Tokyo in perpetual night is one of the best places we've visited in a game all year. Don't miss out on this one. Stray comes in at number eight, and if there was a vibe of the year award, this game would take it, and then later knock it off the trophy shelf with its little paw. The detailed world that's been created here is an absolute pleasure to pitter patter through. Stray is brimming with neat little touches, and its really engaging personality manages to carry its relatively straightforward gameplay through to a satisfying conclusion. It's a lovely game, and one that I think almost anybody can enjoy. Number seven on our list is Splatoon 3, and it's some of the purest fun you can have in a game right at the moment. The Splatoon series has had its gameplay down splat right from the first game, and to be honest, not much has changed. There are new weapons and new maps, but the core is the fantastic, fast and frantic team-based paint swapping that's been there from the start. The third entry adds a new card game that's pretty good, but it's the single player mode where the game has really outdone previous entries. It in particular is incredibly creative, and in our opinion, measures up to Nintendo's best. Speaking of Nintendo's best, Nintendo's best game this year was developed by Ubisoft. 
Sixth place goes to the fantastic Mario Plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope. It makes smart and interesting changes to the first game's really great tactical gameplay and delivers an experience that feels very fresh. The free movement may not seem like much, but battles in this sequel feel much zippier and more freeform. The sparks themselves are a nice addition and there's a really great set of fun to explore areas linking these battles together with enjoyable little side quests and puzzles. The fact that I proactively tried to get into every side battle I could will hopefully give you an idea of how enjoyable this game is. Taking place number five is Cult of the Lamb. If you would have told me at the start of 2022 that a roguelike slash management sim game would be in our top five game of the year list, I'd have yelled at you for wasting time travel on such unimportant information. But once my rage had subsided, I would have been very surprised. Cult of the Lamb manages to find some secret mint source that has combined these genres that aren't usually up our alley into a characterful, smart, engaging, and compelling game. The the combat is enjoyable, the village management is absorbing, and the visuals, and especially the music, are brilliant. One note, I wouldn't recommend the Switch version unfortunately, but other than that, great game. Speaking of great games, not the best transition, The Case of the Golden Idol is the fourth best game of the year, and up there with Return of the Obra Dinn in the pantheon of the best detective games ever made. The brilliantly drawn retro PC game style tableaus you are presented with over the course of the game hide incredibly gratifying logic puzzles that manage to make you feel as though you and your big brains were the sole reason anyone was ever able to make sense of this unsolvable mystery in front of you. Of course, that isn't the case, you're dumb as rocks and you're filling in keywords into cleverly obscured Mad Libs, but the game gives you just the right number of cryptic clues to pull you in to one of the most rewarding games of the year. Marvel Snap makes it to third place. It's a speedy, straightforward deck building game, but there's unexpected strategic depth hidden beneath its glossy Marvel top coat. The games are quick and satisfying, the collection and upgrading enjoyable, and the monetization is non-predatory, which is worth noting and lauding for a free mobile game. It was a little unexpected for us, but Marvel Snap is one of the most well-designed and addictive games of the year. If you have a toilet, you should play this game. You know, if you ever, if you ride a bus or a train, you should play this game. If you drive a train, play this game. Trains go in a straight line. What could you be doing, you know? If you've got a family, play this game. Kids grow up over time. That's time doing that, not you. Play Marvel Snap. In second place is one of the most original games of the year, Neon White. A first-person platformer speedrunning game, again, would have been one of the most off-putting series of words you could have said to me by wasting your time machine at the start of this year. But consider my words officially swallowed because Neon White is a tightly designed, conceptually well-realized breath of uniquely fresh air. It's got nice, clean visuals and absolutely fantastic music. It's just nailing its gameplay the whole way through, feeling concentrated and complete the entire time. The only downside is the flat out unenjoyable story elements, which are easily skimmed over for us personally, but they are an annoyance and it's a shame because it could have been the game of the year, but it's not. So gee whiz, what could be number one? Elden Ring is the best game of 2022. It's one of the best games that we've ever played. It's the culmination of a genre that From essentially invented and has iterated on over the last decade or so. And it's enormous, enthralling, inventive, and just straight up fun to play. The game is challenging, but in the most satisfying way, offering you the feeling of genuine achievement with its tight controls and wide room for finding different ways to play. And there's a sense of exploration that's up there in the conversation with the best games to have ever done it. It has a single-minded approach to what it wants to be, so there is a chance that, as with all art, Elden Ring may not be to your tastes. But I think that you owe it to yourself to find out, because if it clicks with you, Elden Ring may well be for you, as it has been for us, one of the best games you'll ever play. If you'd have come to me in your time machine at the start of 2022 and told me, Adam, guess what? Elden Ring is good. I'd have told you, okay, it only com it comes out in February, so I, I would have known within like a month or two. But you know what? I'm glad you told me. Now let's go find some winning lotto numbers. By the way, this is me. This is a face reveal. That's video footage of me, Adam Knox, one of the hosts of the podcast, Filthy Casuals with Tommy Dasselow, Ben Vanell, and Adam Knox. That's my name. You can listen to our personal top 10 list episodes over there. And we've got a 2023 preview episode coming up. Check it out if this is your first time here. There are links in the description. Thank you so much to everybody who's been with us during 2022. It means the world to us. Happy New Year.